Uh, my name is Wang Choi, and together with Zoe Butt, curator of Journey Beyond the Arrow, we are the conveners and facilitators for today's event, which we are calling From the Multiple, In Process, with Flexibility and Adaptation. Zoe and I hope that today's March Meet will unfold more like an album of songs than your typical conference. Yes, one can hear and enjoy a single song on its own, but in an album, it's also part of a larger assembly. For some artists, their hope is that people will listen to the whole album rather than just hear the hit record out of context. The notion of assembly suggests a gathering with a common purpose, but also that its various components can come from very diverse backgrounds. The composition of an album need not always be structured around narrative and argument. Instead, it can be organized around emotional, intuitive, and poetic purposes. A single album can accommodate many kinds of songs, from solos, duets, a series of tracks with a common motif. Indeed, today will be composed of readings, conversations, and what we call relays. A relay is a set of back-to-back -back presentations that all engage the same theme, but from differing perspectives and geographies. An assembly is not a fixed group, but a specific event in time when different interests and ideas intersect collide or converge. Today's event deliberately takes place in a theater, not just a physical stage, but the stage of the large scale exhibition and the stage of art. We want to argue for the stage of art as a crucial space where our speakers can reflect and share their experience and intelligence, their attitude and vulnerability on a whole range of issues from conflict and intrigue to memory, history and desire. With our March Meet, we hope to offer a performative, discursive experience. Today, we feature artists from Journey Beyond the Arrow, as well as contributors from the publication. Zoe has curated the exhibition with an emphasis on art as life practice, a process of making and leading that is a historical unfolding with no end, where knowledge flows shift according to the experience of user or observer, according to whether one is arriving, departing, or in transit, under indoctrination or assimilation or adaptation. As a way to start the day, I would like to share two rather tangential anecdotes about time. It is my way of broaching the notion of how the mapping of time instructs mobility and how a commitment to time can never be quite finished. The first anecdote concerns dinosaurs. Let us imagine ourselves as cousins with all the creatures on Earth, whether great or small, from, from the largest ancient whale to the tiniest desert ant throughout all of time. And that it is proximity in time that expresses a relation of closeness. So therefore, you and I are closest in time because we are both here in the present. Distant cousins would include our great ancestors from the time when explorers from the Arabian Peninsula ventured to the Malay world in Southeast Asia, where I am from. An even more distant cousin is the Asian ostrich, which ranged from Morocco, the Middle East, China, and Mongolia. It lived from around three and a half million years ago, but then became extinct 8,000 years ago. Speaking of extinction, a very distant cousin would be the dinosaur. Consider the Tyrannosaurus rex, which existed in the late Cretaceous period 68 million years ago. And then you have Stegosaurus from the Jurassic period 150 million years ago. We tend to lump all dinosaurs together, but let us apply our proximity in time relationship. According to this measure, we humans are more closely re related to T. rex than T. rex is to the Stegosaurus. Our distance from T. rex is 68 million years, but the distance between T. rex and Stegosaurus is over 80. I've always enjoyed this factoid, and I suppose the reason is because it provokes us to think of other scales of time. The anecdote just doesn't ask us to think of large expanses, hundreds of millions of years, but it inserts us into the frame, which is the difference between size, a sheer number, and scale, which is about relative comparisons. Scale is about how we fit into the world. And as I've suggested many times, what art often does 
is it helps us to appreciate new and different scales of reference. My other anecdote about time comes from Carlo Rovelli and his book, The Order of Time. Rovelli tells us about the theory of relativity, which Albert Einstein started working on circa the turn of the, uh, the 19th and 20th century, around 1905. What follows is a paraphrase from Rovelli's book. Sundials, hourglasses, and water clocks have existed since the ancient world in the Mediterranean and China, but they did not play the crucial role that clocks today have in our lives. It was only in the 14th century that the era of clock-regulated time begins in Europe, in cities, in villages, where clocks and bell towers mark the rhythms of the day. We use clocks because they tell us the same time. Yet this idea is much more modern than we imagine. For centuries, as long as travel was on horseback, on foot, or in carriages, there was no reason to synchronize clocks between one place and another. In fact, there was good reason for not doing so. Midday, by definition, is when the sun is at its highest. But the sun does not reach midday at the same moment in one town to the next, because, obviously, the sun moves from east to west. So every small village and every large city had its own peculiar, particular midday. But then, in the 19th century in Europe, trains became commonplace and fast. The telegraph was invented, and the problem arose of properly synchronizing clocks between one city and another. You can't organize train timetables if each station marks time differently. And so the West began the process of trying to standardize time, and eventually in 1883, the world was divided into time zones. So it's interesting that before he became famous, before Einstein became famous and gained a university position, the young scientist was working at the Swiss patent office and dealing specifically with patents related to the synchronization of clocks in railway stations. It was probably there that it dawned on him. The problem of synchronizing clocks was ultimately at a cosmological and theoretical level, an insoluble one. In other words, only a few years passed between that moment at which the world agreed to synchronize clocks and the moment at which Einstein realized his special theory of relativity. What I like about this anecdote is it reveals how the horizons of our knowledge were shaped by historic developments in the industrialization of the world and the impositions of scientific political world making onto what was a complex, messy, and plural reality. The artists and contributors to Journey Beyond the Arrow tell different but not entirely unrelated stories that also un unpack the specific context of our horizons of knowledge. And we will hear from some of them today. To close, a couple of procedural notes. Instead of introducing speakers by reading out their biographies, we will refer you to the guidebook, which has them. And instead of questions and answers following each speaker, we'll reserve that for the end of the day, bring back, where, where we bring back all the speakers together for a meet and greet with the audience. So you are encouraged to leave your questions on the question cards, these small kind of question cards, write them down, leave them in the box, and Zoe and I will go over these during the breaks and make a selection. And also during the final meet and greet with artists, we'll take a few questions from the floor. And so we begin. <laughs> 